Sorry, we don't have sound. Hello and welcome to this session of Rasina Dialogue 2021. We are going to talk about three different strands that have emerged in democracies around the world. The left, of course, is there. The right is there. And there's the new disruptor, which is uh, uh, the woke phenomenon. And uh, while doing, doing so, we will look at uh, whether it's time to rethink democracy and technology, which, uh, which is increasingly playing a role in determining the contours of democracy. Uh, the public sphere so essential to the conduct of liberal democracy is under threat. And uh, internal divisions around the world are multiplying. External actors are weaponizing democratic spaces by pushing misinformation, disinformation. And uh, the vehicle used for that is social media platforms. Now, for democracies to ride this storm, they must create public spaces for debate, debate that is diverse, even discordant, but debate which ensures a broad spectrum uh, participation so that there is a sense of, uh, of playing a participatory role. Uh, we'll begin with the question whether uh, uh, digital spaces have transformed elections and electoral processes in recent years. I will begin with, uh, we have with us uh, a stellar uh, group of speakers. We have uh, 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 Marikia Shalke, she is International Policy Director, Cyber Policy Center, Stanford University. Uh, Mr. Bajan Panda, a parliamentarian and Vice President of the Bharatiya Janta Party was supposed to join us, but we are having a, a problem connecting with him. Uh, possibly he will join us somewhere, sometime during the show. We have Celine Calves, President France-India Parliamentary Friendship Group. Uh, Neil Mohan, who is Chief Product Officer, YouTube and SVP Google. James Carafano, Vice President Kathleen, Catherine and Shelby Coulomb. Uh, Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation. And I am Kanchan Gupta with Observer Research Foundation. I would like to begin with uh, uh, Maritya Shake uh, on this whole concept of uh, whether uh, digital spaces have transformed elections and electoral processes in recent times. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really wish we could have all been in India, but unfortunately we're online as everybody else. <clears throat> I don't think it's disputable that digital spaces, digitization, the digital revolution has had a deep impact on the democratic debate, the public debate, the way people access information, but also the way in which their data is collected and then used to micro target advertisements, which could be for, you know, sports gear, food, but also for ideas, for convincing people to vote one way or another, not to vote, whether to trust the authorities in their approach to the COVID pandemic or rather to condemn them. So indeed, there is a lot at stake. If you look at the multi-billion dollar industry of all these online advertising platforms and the amount of people that access their news only through channels like YouTube, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and otherwise. So I think we've seen that the public debate has been impacted, and I wish we could do more uh, academic, independent research into how exactly the data flows lead to different matches with ads and people, what the role of groups are, what the role of video is in radicalizing people online, we mostly know a lot of anecdotal evidence. We know some academic research, but it's very hard for my colleagues at Stanford and at other universities to dig deeper into the actual business models of big tech corporations. So I think that that's a big problem. And even with only anecdotes, we know that there are you know, a, a lot of relations. For example, look at the January 6th events in Washington, D.C., where 
people who believed in a conspiracy theory were brought together for a real life meeting, were then roused to attack the Capitol and ended up in the police investigations having prepared for that attack uh, for months, uh, both online and offline. So those anecdotes are serious enough as they are, but I would say it's it's hugely important to go further in the ability to research, to gain insights, and of course, to apply the proper oversight over these companies uh, for the role that they play in the public and democratic debate and to make sure that they're accountable. Uh, you're, on, you're on mute. Mr. Karafeno, in the U.S., you have been having this debate for some time now on government, on some sort of governance structure for big tech to ensure that uh, there is some some amount of firewalling between uh, technology and the democratic process, the electoral process, the two thirty reforms. Would you like to come in on this? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I would like to disagree somewhat. I, the the fact is the empirical, and I can only speak, of course, for the U.S., but the empirical evidence is not there. And, and, and I do think it's important as we delve into this conversation, and I think we all agree on this, that we have to distinguish between people trying to get people to vote whatever they, way they want, which is part of democracy, and malicious activity, which is uh, illegal intrusion, um, un, you know, um, unfairly manipulating uh, voters, which I think is a separate thing. Um, and, and I don't think the empirical evidence of, of malicious voting changing elections is, is really there, quite frankly. And, and, and I would say on the surface, it kind of a head scratcher of why people think who it is. I get micro targeting and everything else. But the reality is, is you know, particularly in America, we spend many tens of million dollars trying to convince people how to vote. And, and I would completely agree that social networks and online activities have have transformed how we reach out to voters, but 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 the the overwhelming of us yelling at each other to get to people to vote and to argue that malicious activity is somehow shifting votes, well, I, I'm just not sure the empirical evidence is is really there for that. So I I I think voter integrity is a big controversial issue here. Uh, securing voter infrastructure is a big issue, but the the particular uh, malicious influence of social networks themselves, I don't think it is. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of the data will show that the social networking companies, particularly in the United States, actually did a pretty good job in terms of strip, trying to strip out malicious actors during the election, like Russian bots and, and things like that. So I think the, the big focus here, not that we have a, a short attention span in the US, has really moved on from kind of a, the, the election process and, and cyber manipulation onto the larger issue of the relationship between big tech uh, and civil society. And I think that's on the governance issue. And, uh, and, and the real spear point of that here in the U.S. is something called 230 reform. And I think it's worth mentioning to an international audience because I think all of our countries in one way or another are kind of grappling with similar kinds of issues. And it, it's rooted in basic telecom policy in the United States, which is as social networking companies were putting content online, they're, they're not acting like traditional publishers. Therefore, it was unrealistic to hold them to the kind of liability rules like, well, if it's on your site, you're responsible for it. And so they have a degree of, of liability protection uh, because they're not publishers. Well, I think people are looking at that law and saying, well, how can we, we update that? And I think it, it comes down to really um, four basic areas that we're looking at in terms of the reform of this law. And then how this comes out, I think, will very much impact about how people perceive the fairness of, of social networking companies in the United States and their role in either censoring or, or, or shifting or putting their finger on the, uh, uh, on the scale. Uh, just super quickly, one is, um, you know, we say, look, if you, you know, companies should make a good faith effort to keep malicious activity off the Internet, child porn, Russian bots, stuff like that. What we don't really do is define very well is, well, what does a good faith effort really mean? I mean, where have you really demonstrated good faith? So I think that's an area that, that our legislators are looking at. And the flip side of that is, is what's a bad Samaritan? We, we define good Samaritans, but we say, well, well, when is a social platform not acting in uh, somebody's best interest? Um, so, for example, perhaps how they're covering the riots on, on Capitol Hill or Hunter Biden laptop or other issues. 
So there's there's a, a lack of a definition of what is what is a, a failure of, of good intent on the part. Um, and then there's a question of what actually makes somebody a publisher on the on, on the internet. When does a social networking site shift by monitoring content from acting as just a distributor of information to a publisher? That's fairly ill-defined. And I think finally, and I think this is very important, is we have both terms of service and so all of our social network platforms operate what's called community standards. They set standards for what's appropriate and not appropriate on their sites because after all, in the end, these are privately owned um, uh, technologies. I think what what they would, we'd like to see is more definition is publicly uh, publishing terms of, of uh, service and community standards so you would have much greater transparency in holding uh, social networking platforms accountable for when they're following their own rules and when they're not. So I think that's the space that we're working in in internet governance right now. And, and I think it's it's a big debate here in the US. And I think how we come out on that is going to really shape shape the debate for, for years to come. Thanks. Ms. Calvis, would you like to come in on that? Wait, listen. Uh, hello. Um, thank you. I'm delighted to, um, to be amongst you uh, today. And to comment what is um, the way of um, democracy is changing with the technology. At first, um, our first um, thing about this is um, the positive way. People will get more information, people will spread more information, but you know, and uh, the panelists has, uh, have already uh, raised the risk. The risk at it is like you can get fake news, you can spread fake news, and nobody is really um, sure to uh, recognize, to identify what is fake and what is the truth. Um, you just mentioned it, what is bad, what is good, uh, and who will decide of it. But uh, I will um, um, give you some example of um, what the technology and the social network gave to our uh, French politic life um, since five years. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a French member of parliament, I've been elected in 2017, and it was um, a major um, political change because from nowhere a president gets got elected and without no party or will this kind of new uh, deal in the political life uh, has been done with internet and social network because um, five years ago people from across uh, the, uh, the France use a digital tool to bring their ideas together to share it and then we got a program and then it was the way with digital tool that we led the, uh, a, a new party. That is the, the good, good thing to know. But one year after, afterward, there was a major, major um, risk for our democracy. It was the movement of the yellow vests. Um, maybe you've heard of this popular movement uh, from uh, grassroots, uh, they really were um, um, strong because they want to protest and they use social network to know where to gather, uh, what to do, and they spread their movement um, on the ground but with the social network. So we could have just thought that uh, digital tool and social network is a risk. But then we reinverse the ID. We take okay. We can back to um, we we can get back to what is the positive side of digital tool to make a giant consultation. I mean to ask people what they want, what are the needs, and we did with that what we call the great debate. It means we ask the French people to deliver uh, with uh, the digital spaces made for that, to, um, to really um, enrich what we thought of the society and what is something that uh, link us. So sometimes digital space is a positive way and it's really something that is completing our representative democracy. Sometimes it is 
for sure uh, at risk. But what we need as politic political leaders is to find who is controlling the spaces. And we can't really do that alone. We have to do this with the, the platform and with the citizen themselves. As citizens, we must educate citizens, and not only children, with how to use digital space, but also the adults. And adults need sometimes more education about these tools than the children themselves. So that is the way that citizens can be responsible for that. But with the platform, we must also control the way that they are dealing with the news. Um, and for that, in France, we had some legislation about how to uh, control the fake news uh, spreading and how to be in a co-regulation between political, between justice and also the platform. Because we can't do this alone, but we can't let also uh, the platform to do their own justice, but we, we can't do without them. Um, and so we are learning a lot from different experience from the country, um, especially I think about the US, uh, but also I think about Europe and the UK. The UK, when they were um, asked if they will remain or leave uh, Europe, there was this major um, and this information about what is Europe representing for the UK. And from this experience and sometimes bad experiences, we must be aware of what to do. But we can't do this alone, and we have to do this with the citizen, but also with the social networks. Thank you. Mr. Mohan, uh, you know, three speakers, each of them making one common point. Uh, the need for some sort of a governance structure for big tech, uh, the need for uh, looking at content, who controls that content, and uh, linked to that is uh, the other question that can, how exactly can the democratic process uh, and the election infrastructure which is at the core of the democratic process uh, be protected? from disinformation and influence operations which are done, which are conducted with the help of platforms. And uh, the other question, of course, is are the platforms now mere intermediaries or are they uh, curators of news or are they actually pushing out news in a certain manner? Yes, I, I think those are all excellent questions. And, and before, I, before I share my thoughts, I just want to say also it's a privilege to be here on this panel. I too would love to have been doing this in, in Delhi back in, back in India, but it's great to be able to join everybody here uh, virtually. And just listening to the remarks of my fellow panelists, I have to say, um, obviously, as you can see, there's you know, a diversity of opinions and, and thoughts in terms of how platforms like YouTube and, and Google uh, and others um, play a role in terms of the democratic process, in terms of uh, you know free discourse in societies. Uh, and my team, of course, is uh, I'm responsible not just for for building you know the YouTube products that we all use on a on a daily basis, but also my teams are responsible for our community guidelines and how we enforce our content policies on our platform. So I'll just share a little bit of how that process uh, and technology actually works and how uh, we showed up uh, at YouTube in terms of uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, fighting misinformation there, uh, and uh, protecting the integrity of elections, whether they were you know, the largest uh, democratic process that happened in India uh, in the world in 2019, uh, that's happening in four states right now in India, as well as the US election that happened here just, uh, just a few weeks ago, and elections all over the world. Uh, and so first and foremost, I would say that you know, YouTube's mission is to give everybody a voice and show them the world. And as my fellow panelists just said, this diversity of opinion, this freedom of thought, freedom of speech is really kind of at the uh, essence of what YouTube is when it was created 15 years ago. We've been in the Indian market for 13 years. Uh, and that has created a diverse ecosystem of creativity, of freedom of ideas, diverse opinions across the entire political spectrum, but not just a uh, uh, speech from political leaders and government entities and journalists and academics, but also from artists and musicians 
uh, creative types, athletes, etc. Really just this entire vibrant creative economy that has sprung up because of the open platform uh, like YouTube, where you can share your ideas and thoughts with the world without a gatekeeper governing what your speech is or what have you. And in order to actually maintain that open platform, and I think this is the critical point, we've always had a robust set of community guidelines because without enforcing community guidelines, protecting the ecosystem of users, creators, partners from things like hate speech or misinformation or adult content or protecting children, uh, you wouldn't be able to have an open platform because there wouldn't be any users or creators. And so I think those two sort of potentially sort of competing ideas of, of, of um, community guidelines and, and protecting the platform where, versus an open platform, they, they actually go hand in hand and really reinforce each other. And so that's, that's sort of a, a critical point uh, that I would make. Uh, as, as it relates to your question around the elections, as I mentioned, uh, that has been a priority for us, as, as, our, as my fellow panelists said. Of course, platforms like YouTube played a critical role uh, in elections, the Indian elections, the U.S. elections, and elections around the world, because they gave a platform for political leaders, candidates, to share their points of view with their uh, potential voters, with their constituents, and uh, YouTube uh, has invested a lot of resources in making sure that that can happen in a transparent manner. For example, we have uh, worked with political candidates across the political spectrum to make sure they have a presence on our platform and can share their opinions and thoughts. We have uh, robust transparency efforts in terms of where news organizations need to declare, for example, where their funding might be coming from so that users can make judgments about the nature of that news. We have products in our platform. Every time you open up the YouTube app on your phone, for example, we might be triggering a breaking news shelf or top news where news comes from channels on YouTube that have deemed themselves to be authoritative around particular types of content through credible, credible reporting of news, et cetera. That is front and center for our users. And then, of course, we have community guidelines and policies that enforce policies around hate speech, harassment, misinformation. Around elections, we have a robust uh, intelligence desk that goes after, uh, as James just mentioned, uh, foreign inter uh, interference, influence operations, uh, uh, technical manipulation of content like videos, etc., so that we can thwart those efforts before they actually even get to our viewers. And so, um, by raising up authoritative voices, making sure that our recommendations are reducing recommendations of misinformation, and then having robust content policies that are actively pulling down content that might be promoting hate speech or misinformation or harmful com criminal conspiracy theories, all of these efforts uh, work in tandem to protect the integrity of elections uh, and uh, allow people to share a diversity of opinions, uh, share their ideas with their voters, with their constituents, but do it in a way that is safe uh, and as protected as possible from misinformation. And of course, in all of these efforts, uh, we are not doing this alone. Uh, these aren't rules that are being written sort of uh, in, in, uh, in a black box at YouTube. We work with third party organizations, many of them represented here on this panel. Uh, across the political spectrum to determine what those rules should be. Uh, expertise is not just, you know, determined from one country. We try to pull in experts from all over the world to determine uh, the way policies work on our platform. Uh, and of course, we work with regulatory bodies, uh, political bodies to determine uh, 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 what the rules of the road should be and how do we strike that balance in terms of an open, diverse platform and the frameworks that need to be in place uh, driven by regulatory bodies in terms of uh, protecting users. And so that's a little bit of just giving you a flavor of how this process actually works uh, from the inside at a platform like YouTube. Mr. Panda, no gatekeepers, free speech, uh, breaking news which Big Tech decides which news to break when. Uh, integrity of elections is being protected by big tech now. Uh, how, how do you respond as, as a practicing politician, as somebody who has been elected to parliament not once but several times, and as the vice president of uh, India's largest political party, uh, how, how do you respond to these, th these points? As well as how, how how, how do political parties 
plan to figure out uh, ways and means of uh, preventing the system from being gained. So, apologies. Uh, thank you, Kanchan. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be part of this panel. Uh, I think one of the things that we tend to forget is that as far as the public space is concerned, as far as politics is concerned, the huge impact of technology is still very, very new. Technology has, has been playing a big part of our lives uh, for a long while. I mean, the Internet is already a quarter century old uh, in, in mass usage. But um, a turning point for me uh, is, is the 2008 U.S. election where a relative outsider leveraged technology to become the president of the U.S. And as uh, Ms. Calvis just pointed out, uh, similarly with the current French president. And if you look at our uh, prime minister today in India, he too was an outsider who was an early uh, political pioneer of the use of technology in India and uh, has certainly leveraged it, uh, as have many others after him. So it's, uh, you know, in, I, I still recall just before the 2014 election, uh, quite a number of Indian political pundits still used to scoff at technology uh, and, and had much more faith in the traditional systems of how we ran political campaigns. A lot has changed. And this is something where uh, what happens in Europe or what happens in the U.S. or elsewhere also impacts the rest of the world, as does what happens in a large democracy like India. So um, the issues that we've been just talking about, how the norms of free speech have changed because of restrictions brought in on account of hate speech. And I think one of the most important developments is the gatekeepers issue, because you have a handful of large tech giants which today uh, sit in judgment as to what uh, can be purveyed, what cannot be purveyed. And this, I think, is an issue. This is a problem. Uh, the, the analogy that I would use uh, is a commercial analogy going back 100 years when large companies like Standard Oil became not just monopolies, but became something akin to utilities where the average person couldn't do without them. Then government had to step in and regulate and even break up. Now, today we have to have the same approach because, you know, if it's a startup company providing a new service that a politician or a business person uses, uh, you can take it or leave it, and if they choose not to serve you, you can find somebody else. But if some of the, if the big uh, tech, five or seven big tech giants decide not to serve you, you are effectively off the grid. And they, you can see that happens to ordinary people. It happens to even heads of state. Now, we may disagree with what a head of state says or does, but deplatforming should not be the uh, the... Uh, you know, that, that power should not be there with unaccountable people whom nobody elected to take those decisions. It should be uh, addressed by the courts. It should be addressed by regulatory systems. It should not be by corporate executives. And, you, you know, they make mistakes. Uh, um, so, for example, recently a major microblogging site has apologized profusely in a U.S. Um, uh, congressional hearing because it had the platform a newspaper and months later now admits that it was a mistake. So uh, we in India are facing exactly this same issue. Earlier, one of my fellow panelists mentioned the events of the first week of January on Capitol Hill in the US. Now, we've had something almost identical to that happen three weeks later on our Republic Day on January 26th when uh, rioters uh, went right up to, uh, inside uh, the heart of Delhi and uh, uh, desecrated one of our symbols of the Republic. And yet the very same platforms, the very same technology titans who had taken a certain stand to, uh, uh, to with an iron hand, clamp down on that kind of misuse of the technology, uh, took a totally different stand when it came to India, continuing to provide a platform to those who were urging violence, continuing to provide a platform to those who are actively indulging in violence, while using their platforms. So you, community standards have to have consistency. You can't have a different community standard for Capitol Hill and a different community standard for the Red Fort of India, uh, the two largest democracies in the world. So we, 
do need to recognize that since all this has happened very rapidly in a decade or a dozen years, uh, it, it is time and people are beginning to speak up. We've had a bit of discussion about whether tech platforms uh, uh, should bear responsibility for the content. Uh, if, are they just neutral platforms? So I won't go into that very much more. But it is a fact that many of these big platforms are no longer neutral purveyors of other people's uh, opinions. They do have strong opinions of their own, and they make uh, no bones about expressing that. And when it comes to a country like India and the kind of neighborhood that we live in, it's important to keep in mind that we do actually have serious issues that go beyond social media. We do have a, a couple of neighboring countries that employ hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps even millions of people, engaged actively in something that can only be described as cyber warfare. Uh, we've had issues where uh, our electricity grid has been impacted and fingers have been pointed in those directions. So these can't be taken lightly. And some of these players do, in fact, uh, hijack public platforms, including social media platforms, and uh, uh, leverage them in a way that is not healthy for democracy. So the last thing I want to say is that uh, democracies are responding to this. You've had, for instance, proposals uh, such as in the EU, the Digital Services Act, or in the UK, the Online Safety Bill, which go into these issues. And India, too, has taken a step with our uh, uh, IT rules amendment that has been notified uh, by the Ministry of Information Broadcasting, uh, basically addressing many of these issues. These are not comprehensive answers, and I'm sure we will need to keep amending them because this is a fast-changing field. But it's uh, something that can no longer be brushed under the carpet. Thank you, Mr. Panda. Uh, Ms. Shakir, uh, you know, these big tech platforms, uh, they were supposed to, and they have in a large measure, democratized uh, the, the public space, they have democratized speech, uh, the, the, the whole debate that happens in democracies. But at the same time, we are now seeing the rise of a new phenomenon called cancel culture, which leads to deplatforming individuals about which uh, Mr. Panda just now mentioned. Uh, do, do you think that uh, can this whole idea of deplatforming somebody, of silencing a voice, be consistent with a social order built around the platform economy, uh, which by definition has to be inclusive. Thanks for the question. So I think it has that the, the platforms and uh, uh, digitization have not as much led to democratization as to commercialization of the debate. And so I think that that is the crux of the matter. And in that case, when profits are the key driver, when arbitrary decisions can be made about who gets to speak or who doesn't, when money is very much behind, you know, how much reach a voice can achieve or uh, how much capabilities uh, a party, maybe a foreign actor, uh, can can wield to make sure that their um, opinions are, are looking popular, even if it's with fake accounts. All of these practices are going on on these commercial digital platforms. And it's also just common business practice which can have an influence on elections. I mean, YouTube, for example, exclusively sold its home page to Donald Trump on election day. A business decision, but one that certainly, you know, gives an advantage to one side over the other. And in a country like France, for example, there's rules around stopping the campaign for the last, I think, 48 hours uh, before elections. Uh, which, which you know, is, is a different approach to how much advertising and campaigning is allowed, for example. So, to make a long story short, I believe that a lot of the decisions that are currently made by commercial companies are actually public policy decisions. And we should not want to have commercially motivated companies making those decisions, whether it's about deplatforming, whether it's about uh, the limits of freedom of expression or rather exemptions to freedom of expression, the guaranteeing of human rights online are so essential to preserving the rule of law, preserving people's rights, that they cannot be left to commercial companies. I think it's increasingly uncomfortable for the companies themselves, but if it were up to me, we would take those decisions back to where they belong in the context of the rule of law and democratic oversight.
Yeah, can I, can I just radically you, disagree? Yeah, yeah I, was, I, was, I was coming to you, Mr. Kayaka. No. Yeah. No, uh, not to take, yeah, not to take know, on the one side. <laughs> but I want to take... On the one hand, platforms claim yeah. that there, there are no gatekeepers. And yet, at the same time, they also practice deplatforming. Yeah. So how does it matter? Well, I'd like to kind of take, Neil. first of all, I think there's two separate issues here. And I think Mr. Panda actually outlined them very nicely. I, I, I do radically disagree that these are things that government needs to take back control of. I, I think that's actually the greatest threat to democracy that you could possibly have. The notion that government would be responsible for deciding what is free and legitimate speech is, I, I think, far more terrifying than the threats we're seeing now. You know, we, we parse the difference between the, 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 the space of free speech and the space of criminal activity and, and criminal speech, and, and government plays a role in that in that distinction, and I think that's appropriate. I oh, think when you're talking, about, yeah, no, let me just finish. I think what you're talking about is a far greater expansion. I, no, okay, Ray disagrees, but that's fine. Look, first of all, I think the the notion of of, of breaking these companies up and it doesn't really really solve the problem. I think you know, Ray Jay pointed out the exact problem is is there's a distinction between being a publisher and being a platform. That's one issue, and and I actually don't have a problem with, with publishers having a point of view. All of our papers do. All of our broadcast networks do. I really don't care if you who, uh, Yahoo has a, a political view and they want to sell political ads. That's fine. But that's a different role than being a neutral platform. And I think one of the things that the 230 reform is designed to do is designed to help distinguish those two different roles. And so if you want to, be a, if you want to moderate political content and have a political voice, fine. Break that off from your role as a as a service provider, which I don't think has to be a utility. I think we actually should get rid of utilities. Um, but the, the, my great concern here is we, we have rules for criminal speech and criminal activities. Figuring out how to apply those in the digital world, all for that. But dealing with woke speech, for example, which is essentially the flip side of hate speech, right? Woke speech is not just language that is a criminal activity, it's language that we don't like and therefore should be considered impermissible and barred. I think that's highly problematic. Um, should we com combat hate speech online? Absolutely. Um, you want to combat woke speech online? Absolutely. I think that's done in, in creating the interchange of ideas, not in, in limiting the process of, of, of free speech. So I'm really afraid what you're doing is conflating two social problems, right? The the the, the false and public debate and and criminal activity, uh, rather than saying about how can we make sure that criminal activity isn't facilitated by online providers. And I I think Neil would be the first person to admit that, you know, when it comes to blogging, criminal speech, child porn, you know, malicious activity, they'd be the first to stand up as as, as a as a corporate the corporate responsibility. They want to contribute uh, to dealing with that. But I think you know forcing them to be an adjudicator of free speech is wrong. But I equally think it's a, a terrible idea to say no government should adjudicate free speech. Just a short response. A short response. One, I think it's important to remember that that the world is not under U.S. law. So you all have a First Amendment, uh, but there is also other considerations than than just speech or criminal speech. There is the the notion of you know respect for people's rights, non discrimination, protection of public health, protection of public order and safety. Those can come into play when we look at how online discourse actually influences people in the real world. Think about anti-vaxxers, for example, or think about people who are roused to attack the United States Capitol. So I think we have to understand how there can be friction between different rights that are all important rights in and of themselves. Then secondly, just to clarify, I am suggesting that these decisions should be based in the rule of law process, not arbitrarily by governments, you know, uh, up to their uh, political whims, but it anchored in the law and in a in a due process, which I think is often lacking when these are commercially made decisions, which are by no means neutral. They're by no means neutral. They're commercially driven. They're maybe algorithmically driven. There may be unintended consequences. They may be gamed or influenced or manipulated by, by outside actors, but it's important to note that uh, there is no such thing as a neutral platform. Can I jump in? Since there's been a lot of opinion shared about uh, the platform yeah. here, and so yeah. let me let me just uh, uh, jump so in I'll and just. Come, can I, I'll, I'll just come to you. 
Uh, before that, if we could just uh, hear out Ms. Galvez in case she has some points to make on this. Uh, thank you. Um, about deplatforming and maybe uh, what we call cancel culture and what is it, um, how it's linked to uh, the woke uh, movement. I think that um, most of the time, uh, cancel culture is um, um, a lead to um, call for censorship, to erase something. And who is erasing that is a crucial question. I think that with the woke movement, as its basis, we should hear something else. It is about um, we. It's more about adding than erasing. It's more about um, contextualizing uh, that uh, censoring. So, with that said, we must uh, favor we, we must favor uh, the freedom of speech and all that. But we lot of information because if we have to add something who was undercover during a long time because we, 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 we won't face it. How will we should choose what uh, information should be raised as uh, important or less important? Um, I agree that uh, it should not be based on government. It should not be based by another kind of new government that would be the uh, five or big platforms because it's you know you know this expression code is low no uh, we are experiencing that because we have to um, convey the solution um, how do we do with the code law when we are lawyer or legislator and so we must really get into know what is the algorithm. Um, and as I'm, I, I, I can say that my colleague from the uh, French Parliament are eager to know more and more about the economy, but also about the technology, because when we get more um, aware of that, we can find what is the right legal solution to, um, to, to be able to limit risk. And by its solution, one uh, is really important to me, is the transparency of algorithm. I think that we have to, do to, to have transparency about the data, about the use of algorithm. I know that algorithm is really key to um, economic model to the platform, but it's so important that transparency is um, has to be so we get to be uh, really um, exigent, very demanding with the platform because without that we we can't have trust. And if we don't have any trust, how can be democracy follow? Um, so I really keen on um, what is beyond technology and what we should as a um, public officer or elected people know about what is behind the curtain. Uh, may you. I just make a Mr. quick, quick Mr. clarification, Mr. Kanchan? I'll just yeah. take 30 seconds because I think something I've said may have been misunderstood and that's uh, digressing the discussion. I, I didn't mean that government should regulate uh, platforming and deplatforming. That's why I specifically said courts have a role to play. Yeah. And I should have clarified that legislatures have a role to play. Uh, I think governments do have a role in terms of the regulatory bodies that come into place. And that's why I was referring to the EU and the UK bill. Now, just to give an analogy, we, we also have major developments in biotechnology. And it would be horrifying if we were to accept that the, the inventor of a new technology in a laboratory or a company should decide what gene editing technologies can be used by millions of people and what can't be used. So governments, legislatures, courts do have a role. They, they are uh, elected and, and represented by elected authorities. We certainly can't have unelected individuals decide what is appropriate for billions of people. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Mohan, uh, if, uh, a very quick comment from you and then we will go in for closing comments. We are now really running out of time. All right, I'll try to be quick, but uh, let me just respond to a few things here because obviously lots of opinions shared about platforms like YouTube, so I just want to set the record straight on a, on a few items here. So first, I mean, I would say that, uh, uh, of course, um, we want to work with government agencies, regulators. I spend a bunch of my personal time, my team's time, 
uh, with uh, you know regulators all over the world discussing better ways that uh, uh, you know YouTube can play uh, the role that it plays uh, in a way that uh, satisfies the frameworks that that governments have. Uh, of course, uh, we've been doing that for years. For example, in India, for the last 13 years, and we'll continue to do so uh, on a lot of the measures. For example, that uh, that Mr. Panda mentioned, and so that will continue. And we want to continue to partner with government agencies, regulators, etc. Uh, when we uh, establish our community guidelines and rules, it's not done in a black box. We do that in an open manner. Uh, with people from across the political spectrum, all parts of the world. And back to the point about transparency, I agree with that completely. We publish those guidelines clearly on our site and we try to enforce them in a way where we're not distinguishing between regions of the world, who the speaker is. We try to enforce them uniformly, regardless of whether it's a private citizen, head of state, or what have you, in a way that's transparent and clearly published uh, on our platform. And our responsibility is to make sure that you know YouTube as an open platform shows up, shares uh, diverse points of view, and does that in a way that uh, builds up um, things like election integrity, uh, free functioning democratic societies, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, you know clamping down on them. And so that is that's always been our mission. It'll always remain our mission. We continue to partner with government entities all over the world on all of those measures that were mentioned, whether it's Section 230, the DSA. Uh, GDPR, copyright provisions, e-commerce, we're regulated across all of these pieces uh, and we enforce the laws in terms of legal content in every country that we operate in, uh, in partnership with government entities and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Now, we have exactly three minutes left and uh, I, will, I will ask, uh, I would request uh, Ms. Shake to make a 30 second comment and then we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I believe that democracy and public values really need safeguarding. I'm excited about technological opportunities, but there are some values, rights, and freedoms that should not be disrupted. That's what the focus of this debate should be about. Um, Mr. Panda, um, uh, would you like to quickly come in? I wholeheartedly endorse that because uh, just as technology has disintermediated in commercial fields, we don't use travel agents anymore, we do it ourselves. It has also disintermediated in the political and democratic fields and has given access to uh, millions of people to leverage their voice. But we are at an interesting uh, fork in the road where uh, this en enormous power is, I think, at risk of being hijacked. And we have seen a few examples that are worrying. And that is why with this, this debate that we are having is very, very critical. And I completely endorse the viewpoint of uh, my previous panelist. Mr. Carafano, 30 seconds for you. Yeah, no, I just want to say, I think the Racina dialogue is one of the most important international conversations in the world. I really, you know, hats off to you guys for find a way to continue this. I'm sorry we can't do it on purpose. I think this conversation just demonstrates that this is this is a really, really valuable time. And thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. And Ms. Calvis, the last 30 seconds to you before we close. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got some wonderful digital tools. This panel is a uh, proof of that because uh, in pandemic situation we can uh, change. But digital tools without any effort, more effort on education, can lead to something very bad for our democracy, for our lives. So uh, my, 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 my closing will be on the power of education and the need to invest in education to know what to do with these wonderful tools. Thank you, everybody. We had a very interesting discussion. And uh, uh, the, the, the common points that have emerged that there's greater need for transparency, there's greater need for uh, creating firewalls between democracy, uh, the democratic process, and big tech platforms, and the need to revisit content to ensure that it does not end up influencing the process instead of facilitating uh, democracy and, uh, in, a, or in a sense, uh, expanding the scope of democracy. And why deplatforming really is not a good idea. 
uh, and uh, it really shouldn't happen. If you are not a gatekeeper, then you shouldn't be deplatforming individuals, irrespective of, uh, unless it's, of course, hate speech or it's something which uh, is indis indisputably uh, harmful. Uh, and uh, with that, we come to an end uh, of, uh, to, of this session, and uh, hopefully next year we will meet in Delhi and things will be better. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Great to be with everybody. Thank you.